Good Morning Cypress Creek to what Cynthia called our camp meeting. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not old enough to know what that means, so we'll have to get it. <laughs> it is a gift from above to be able to welcome you to this place, even in the dark. <laughs> Will you join me in the call to worship, even though there is no screen for you to repeat for <laughs> God, the creator of all. Jesus, the visible sign of the invisible God. The Spirit, the living breath of God. One God, three persons. One God, three revelations. One God, three manifestations. One God, let us worship. Will you join with me in prayer? Nope. 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 It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no lights and no script. <laughs> whoa, 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 I haven't announced it yet. So, underneath your, underneath your, uh, your chairs or around you is a hymn, is a blue hymnal. They are car courtesy of First Christian Church of Tulsa, which gave them to us in 2017. Just in case you wanted to know. And we're going to be doing Holy, 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 hymn number four, verses one, two, and four. You can stand if you are able. Or you can sit if you are able. Either one. <laughs> encouragement and inspiration to not only speak of our place in the family of God, but to live passionately for the sake of the entire human family. We offer these words of prayer in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. If you got, still have your hymnal, we're going to do hymn number 22, verses 1 and 3. That's hymn number 22, verses 1 and 3, the great Last uns erfreuen, or as we better know it, all creatures of our God and King. <laughs>
you are seated, turn and just wave to those around you. I invite you to go ahead and be seated. I want to welcome you to Cypress Creek Christian Church, a community striving to put love first in all things. A funny thing happened on my way into the forum this morning. <laughs> and like many of you, you'll understand when I say I stood over here and I flipped on the switch and flipped it off, and flipped it on and flipped it off. I don't know how many times I tried it as if somehow on the seventh or eighth time the light would actually come on. But as a few people have said, just because there's no electricity, we as people of faith are plugging into something else. And I am thankful for that presence that is here, whether the lights are on or not. I want to share a number of things with this community. First, uh, many people have been asking about Paula Gambala, who had knee replacement surgery this week. I talked to her again late last night. Uh, the physical therapist yesterday before she left uh, the hospital had uh, worked her over good and so she said she was feeling it but they feel as if everything went very well so I know she appreciates the prayers of this community uh, yeah my next announcement doesn't even work anymore so forget that one uh, I do want to lift up that uh, Next Sunday, we have a blood drive here at the church. Blood mobiles showing up bright and early. You sign up online, and we want to fill all of those spots because the last time that we had a blood drive, we actually had the single largest number of, of folks that gave. And I'd love to see us meet that or surpass it this time. So if you can give that gift of life, I hope you will consider doing so. Well, I want to share with you that today there's a transition going on behind the scenes over in the Children's Ministry building. Uh, Sarah, our current Children's Director, and Teresa, our new interim, are kind of crossing over. And so you may meet Teresa here at some point this morning or in the weeks to come, and I hope you will welcome her. But let's be clear, Sarah is staying on. She just is having to step back a little bit, but she wants to continue to volunteer because she says, I found my church and I'm not going anywhere. And so we are thankful that she's going to continue to volunteer in our children's ministry. So from their perspective, the kids' perspective, there's probably not going to be any change at all. And then finally, I want to lift up, and maybe you saw it as you came in, there are tables over just beyond this wall uh, with candles on them. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, and we are inviting you after the service, if you would like to do so, to go and light a candle. Maybe there's somebody within your own family or family tree that you wish to remember who died in service. And so we invite you, or maybe you just want to light one uh, just in a more generic way for those who have. I hope you will take the time. There, I tell you, there's just something about lighting a candle. It is such a simple act, and yet it carries with it great power. Well, a few people asked what happened. <laughs> it would take the next 45 minutes to explain what happened, but let me, in short, share. Uh, when they were digging the hole for the floodgates, they tore up a bunch of cables. They needed to fix those. It didn't affect anything but the pole lights. Well, when they were fixing those cables, something blew, and uh, it will take until Tuesday to get the pieces they need to uh, get this building back going. I will just add, it might have been nice for the electrician to have called us last night, but uh, that will be for a whole different conversation. But again, let me celebrate your flexibility and the joy that you brought into this space even though things were going to be different. This is a church that has gotten used to being a little different. <laughs> well, today is Trinity Sunday, 
And I'm going to be looking at a passage from the 8th chapter of Romans. That's, that's the chapter that the very end, Paul writes about how there is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God. But earlier in the chapter, we come across these words. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Here ends the reading. Let's pray. Open our hearts and minds that we might meet you, the living word within these spoken words that are found within the written word. Amen. Paul Smith is a retired Baptist minister and a sort of modern-day mystic. Paul was on the speaking circuit back in the 70s, and he talks about being at a number of events and again, late 70s, this is when it was President Carter. He was at these events with Ruth Carter Stapleton, President Carter's sister. And one time as they were chatting, he asked her about her brother. And she proceeded to tell Paul all about Jimmy. The first time that she referred to the President of the United States as Jimmy, Paul literally flinched. How audacious, he thought, to refer to the President of the United States using his first name. What does she think? She's family? Oh, yeah, she is family. Audacious. It means bold. It means daring. Some might even say it gives a sense of recklessness. There are many, and maybe... That includes some of you. Many who have found the language and claims that we make around God to be a bit audacious. And when you think about it, that's probably a fair assertion. I mean, for example, we refer to God not simply as Father, but Paul says Abba, which is a pretty daring statement. That's not the Swedish rock band. Uh -huh. It is a more enduring term. Some translate it as daddy or papa. And yet folks will say that using that kind of language is, is just a bridge too far. Yet the Apostle Paul would suggest that it's just fine since we are all family a little like the Carters. The whole concept of faith, it is a bit audacious. I mean, think about it for a minute. As followers of Jesus, we speak about the creative energy that is in the universe, and we designate that, that energy with the letters G, O, D. And we suggest that God, this energy in the universe, is actually concerned about us. Creatures on a very small planet orbiting a rather insignificant sun, one planet among an estimated 700 quintillion planets in the known universe. Even the author of Psalm 8 echoes the audacious claims Looking to the heavens, the author is awestruck by the many stars that are visible, asking what are human beings that you, that you, O oh Lord, are mindful of them, mortals, that you would actually care for them. And yet with those questions, the author goes on to speak of 
of more than just a mindfulness, but how God has established a purpose within us. The author, I think, is acknowledging the audacious and outlandish ideas that we claim around God. And the Apostle Paul builds on this in the letter to the Romans, making these rather outlandish claims that, that we are children of God and joint heirs with Christ. Suggesting that we can cry out to God using intimate language. And yet sometimes when we see the language Father or Abba, the, the first reaction is to immediately think about some male deity with a long beard. And, and yet we need to understand it within its historic context. Other religions at the time... They would have been speaking about their national leader, the emperor or the king, as the son of their god. A position and power that rested on that individual and that individual alone. The Roman emperor had been making such a claim for more than a half century before the Apostle Paul started writing. And the Roman emperor had no intentions of giving up that special designation to anyone else. So for Jesus to pray and to teach us to pray using the language our father, he did not say the emperor's father. And then for Paul a few decades later to continue with that language, it would have been an affront to the Roman power structures. It would have been an audacious claim to say that everyone including the common folk, the poor, the marginalized, the rejected, those who found themselves in prison, they all could call God using that intimate language, for God had adopted them, giving them the same family position and authority as Jesus and the emperor. Audacious, outlandish language, and yet Paul, I don't think, used it just to shock and, and awe people. Paul was not just giving good material to preachers and scholars. This was more than material on which to ruminate and reflect. I think the Apostle Paul was trying to paint a picture, a picture of the intended universe that is about relationship and responsibility and a much larger sense of kinship. A few years back, we here at Cypress Creek did a study on a book, Dare to Dream. I know some of you participated in that. The author, Michael Slaughter, borrowed a key element from a business book, Built to Last. A BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. But Michael Slaughter pushed it a little bit, suggesting that we need to God-size our dreams and suggesting that we need to have big, hairy, audacious, not only the uh, big, hairy, audacious goals, but we need to find that God purpose that is rooted in the audacious claims that are made in Scripture. The audacity is not so much found in what we say, though sometimes it does sound... Uh, a step beyond the outlandish. It's not so much what we say, but what we do with those audacious claims. They are, they are all images and stories and metaphors that are communicating a very specific vision of life and community. Like I said, it is Trinity Sunday. The idea that God is one, and yet God has complexity in the very nature of God. Historically, we use language of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. Some have suggested God is for us, God comes to us, God dwells within us. And yet if someone was to say to us, prove it, how would we do that? <clears throat> and yet in history, people have taken this concept of the Trinity 
and used it as a litmus test, as a defining statement of whether you are in or you're out. Do you believe in the Trinity? Oh, yes, I do. Okay, well, then we will teach you the secret handshake, and you are now an insider. Oh, you don't? Well, there was even a time in history where if you said you did not, it was, it was this. For Jesus and Paul, this just seems strange. Because as I read them, and this is maybe my take, but it appears that they make these outlandish claims as a way of, of casting a vision. And then inviting people to live into that vision. For them, they were not simply creating another belief system defined by an adherence to a list of ideas. It was a way of life. They were casting forth a vision and saying, come and join us. Of course, what happens when we make these claims and no one actually lives into them? When I was in college, a group of us formed an intramural basketball team. Intramural sports was a big thing where I went to college. In the weeks leading up to the very first game, whether we were in the cafeteria or wherever it might be, we talked a big game. There was a lot of trash talk going on. We talk about how we had players on our team that could light it up from three-point land. We talked so big. We made these audacious claims, and, it, and, and absolutely not one of them was true. <laughs> In fact, we might have been the single worst basketball team to ever, in the history of the sport, to step on the court. <laughs> that first game, though, the other team showed up, and they were taking us very seriously for about one minute. <laughs> we had talked a good enough game that they believed it. The games to come, no one else believed it. And yet we had the biggest crowds because they just wanted to come and see how really bad we were. <laughs> we talked a good game, but there was nothing, nothing at all to back it up. Maybe there's part of the problem. We make these outlandish statements of faith and then say, you've got to believe it just as it is instead of maybe thinking of it in a different way. That maybe those outlandish statements were Jesus or Paul casting a vision and saying, now join me in trying to live into that vision. Recently, I learned of something called this Audacious Project. It's related to TED Talks. I'm sure some of you have caught a few TED Talks over the years. But this is an organi organization that looks at small nonprofits who are making some really outlandish claims. It studies them, and then those who, that really have the possibility of making a difference in the world Suddenly, this project brings to them money and energy and people. Groups that want to combat hunger worldwide or racism. Groups that want to provide a, a way of stopping a pandemic before it even begins. Groups that want to offer mental health services in new and creative ways. And the list goes on from there. Audacious claims that, that are powerful. And then this company, this organization, brings energy to that. Resources, money, and people. Let's say you woke up tomorrow morning and made an announcement to all your friends that you plan to swim from California to Hawaii. That's a pretty big claim to make. And I'm guessing your friends might chuckle a little bit and then say something like, hey, go for it. 
But if you don't even own a swimsuit, and it's been a decade since you were even in a swimming pool, they're probably not going to take you very seriously. Well, the church has been making outlandish claims about God since its conception. And yet so often in history, the church has not even owned the proverbial swimsuit. And it's just easy to make the claim and not take the next step. And ask what that claim is communicating. Because I think often what we find in those amazing, outlandish statements is a vision. A vision of what the world was intended to be, what the relationships we have with one another, what they should be, and we are being invited to live into them. I think it is often less about adhering to these claims and finding the vision that is contained within them. And then taking that next step and actually living it. The world right now, I mean, all you have to do is read the statistics. Christianity is not only declining in this nation and worldwide, it is declining quickly. And yet you ask those on the edge, on the fringe, why? why they're not interested in church, one of the most common statements is that they hear what the church says, but they don't see a church that's living into it. One of the things that Cypress Creek Christian Church has been trying to do is not only make the claim that we believe in a God who first loved us, but that we believe we've been called to to be a community that puts love first. Man, that really looks good as a tagline at the bottom of, of some piece of paper that we hand out. But that's a pretty outlandish statement. That we want to be a training center that helps people to live the love first life. Not just when we gather here for a little time on Sunday morning but to help train people so that wherever they might be, they are living the love first life. I'm not saying we do it so that we can grow as a church, but I am convinced that if we do live it, people will be drawn to it because they desire to be a part of something much bigger than themselves. They desire to be a part of a community that really knows how to live the love that was put on display in the life of Jesus. That's quite a calling. But I think we're ready. And we are at a moment where there is a hunger like, like we haven't probably seen in generations. Are we just going to make some outlandish statements as a community? Or are we going to see them as a vision that's beckoning us to live differently? join me in prayer? <clears throat> Holy God, complex yet one in essence. Holy God, you are the divine network united in one purpose. Today on this Trinity Sunday, we seek your help as we do more than make these wild claims. In Jesus, we have been invited to see in those outlandish claims a, a whole new world, a world in which we are to live and serve and to learn how to love and to put that love first. Where faith has become nothing more than a set of rules and doctrines, we pray that we will recognize your great vision and, and purpose being set forth in those ideas, a vision and purpose to which we are called to embrace and and to live. It won't be easy. And yet because we do it as community, because we do it through your spirit, it is, it is possible. And we pray that as we gather, that you will continue to shape and form us as individuals and as a community, that we might live into that great calling 
to be a community that puts love first in all things. A, a community that claims some pretty crazy things about you, Lord. And yet in those claims is a pretty powerful vision of not only who you are, but who you are calling us to be. We offer our words now in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. This is Mark Hayes' arrangement of all creatures of our God and King.
a table is set before us. And we say some pretty wild things about communion. I mean, when you really think about it for a moment, you hold a, a little wafer of bread and a thimble full of juice, and you say, this is the body and blood of Jesus. No, it's, it's a little wafer and a little cup of grape juice. And it's interesting, throughout the history of Christianity, we have argued. I know it's a shock to you that Christianity is argued now and then. <laughs> We've argued over what does that mean and how do we speak about the presence of Jesus in this meal? Transubstantiation, consubstantiation, books written about it, how does it happen? And I always appreciated a Greek Orthodox priest that I knew who talked about, oh, you all argue and you have no understanding of mystery. He said, you are like rolling out bread, and yet you keep on rolling it and rolling it, and it gets so thin that it begins to break apart and fall apart, and it's just worthless. Sometimes we squeeze out every ounce of mystery out of what is happening here. And suddenly we make it into a set of rules. You've got to say this and do that and then you're acceptable. And, and maybe it's not so much about having a perfect understanding of what the bread means and the cup means. Maybe there's something mysterious that can happen by just showing up and participating in community. Maybe the Spirit can use that and begin to form and shape us. We make some crazy statements about what happens at this table, but maybe it's less about really trying to figure that out and asking another question about what has changed because I've been at this table? How am I a different person because I chose to come here? What does it mean that I have partaken of the bread and cup? And how is that going to impact me tomorrow or next week or next month? I invite you to come to the table, not because I have some very specific description of what is going to happen at this table. Because I have a belief in the, in the great mystery that is God, that something can happen, that is amazing and transformative. I can't guarantee it or prove it, and yet at the same time, I have seen what has happened on the other side in people's lives. So in the name of Christ and through the presence of the living Christ, I invite you to prepare yourself to come to this table. As we are doing, uh, ready, ready to sing here. Hey, come up, Joel. Uh, I will say, if you did not pick up one of the little communion uh, elements of bread, raise your hand, and they will bring that to you. We're going to sing hymn number 459. 459, verses 1 and 3. Lord, you give the great commission.
it seems as though every time we gather at this table, we stand up here and we remind you that Jesus invited his disciples to share in the meal. We also remind you that Jesus invited his friends to partake of a meal of bread and wine. This morning is the same, and yet it's a little bit different. Because this morning we're reminding you that Jesus invited you to partake in this meal as disciples, disciples of Christ. Jesus also invites you to this meal as a family, a family of God and a family in this place. It doesn't matter whether this is your first time in this place or whether you've been here a thousand times. You are welcome at this table. And it doesn't even matter if you're not present in this place. If you are at home or at work or anywhere else in front of a screen, you're welcome at this place. And as we always do at the beginning of this meal, we ask that you join us in prayer. Dear Lord, as we gather together this morning as your beloved family, we remember the sacrifice you made in sending your son Jesus Christ to be with us. We give thanks for his legacy in words, actions, and obedience in his suffering. Father, we ask for forgiveness for any thoughts, words, or deeds that have not honored your name. We give thanks for bringing us together as a family and seek guidance in our efforts to boldly share your love with others. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On that Passover evening, Jesus took a simple loaf of bread. He blessed it. And he made something new out of it. As he gave it to his disciples, he said, Take eat, for this represents my body, my body broken for you. And today we ask that you take the bread from underneath your chalice and that you partake in this meal as disciples of Christ with our Lord. And later in the meal, Jesus took the cup. He blessed it, and again he made something new. As he gave it to the disciples, he said, Take drink, for this represents my blood, the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Today we ask that you open your chalice and that you drink of this meal as family of God with our Savior. Well, sisters and brothers, we have gathered, we have shared, we have prayed, we've heard the spoken word, we have gathered around a table. May the Spirit of God that by faith we claim is present with us, may that Spirit continue to shape and form us as those who are ready to give witness to the unconditional love of God. As we do every Sunday, we extend an invitation, an invitation in discipleship. And after this service, if you are interested in talking about what it means to be a disciple in this context, please find me, and I would love to continue that conversation. I now invite you, if you are able, to please stand as we join in our closing <clears throat> Our final hymn is number 27. That's 2 7. And we'll be singing verses 1, 2, 3, 
and four. Oh. <laughs> and then she went to Vanderbilt to get her Master's of Divinity. She has done many things in ministry, uh, including a hospice chaplain, or, yeah, hospice chaplain, and, uh, and now she's going to come and help us for a little while, and we appreciate the gift of, of, of her spirit in this place. I want to remind you about lighting a candle immediately after the service. And now, and I, I, I'm just embarrassed to say, we do this common prayer, and my brain is going blank on how it begins. <laughs> gracious, gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model, and may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen.
Thank you. Let me try this. All right, let me grab all the hymnals because there's a 